The Modern Orchestra is an institution that has been 200 years in the making. It went through many different forms before we get to what you buy a ticket for today. From intersections with the pit orchestra of the Opera House and the orchestra of the church, the Modern Orchestra has beginnings that stretch throughout Europe from Italy to France. My name is Dr. Dominique Royam and I'm a music director, conductor, and music communicator here to help you achieve a deeper connection to the music you love. Follow me on social media at Dominique Royam for more content. Let's talk about the evolution of the orchestra. The elements of what we call an orchestra coalesced around the middle of the 18th century into a remarkably stable tradition. The term orchestra descends from the Greek term for the semicircular space in front of the stage where the chorus stood. The term solidified into today's usage in the 18th century with Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Dictionnaire de Musique in 1768. The proto-orchestra started out as a band of stringed instruments of all types. These stringed instruments were ideally suited to play in a group because of their ability to sustain pitch. Lutes, harpsichords, and other instruments of the middle 1400s were primarily plucked and could not sustain pitch for longer than a split second. These plucked instruments were ideal for solo roles or in a solo ensemble where there's one instrument to a part, but hindered their ability to join an ensemble with more than one instrument on a part, the proto-orchestra. During the 16th century, it became general practice for governments and courts to employ a band of musicians that could play multiple instruments, joining together in solo ensembles for state events. These essentially random conglomerations of musicians gave way slowly to coordinated orchestras of stringed instruments. In 1626, Louis XIII organized one of the first truly standalone orchestras, the Grand Bond, or the La Vie Quatre du Roy. Praise of the most perfect instruments to play dance music, the Grand Bond was composed of six violins, six celli, four violas playing in the second violin range, four violas playing in the alto range, four violas playing in the tenor range. Jean-Baptiste Lully disliked the quality of performance of the Grand Bond and persuaded King Louis XIV to allow him to organize a new orchestra, Le Petit Villon, in 1656. There were 16 instruments in this orchestra, including oboes and bassoons. The orchestra accompanied the Ballet du Corps, danced by the king and the court, and served as the opera orchestra for the Académie Royale de Musique. Lully expanded the role of the the winds in the orchestra, as seen in the use of oboes and bassoons in the bass ensemble of Le Petit Villon. Just as dance spurred the use of the string orchestra in France, opera and oratorio were the impetus of the orchestra in Italy. Opera and oratorio were the most innovative forms in the Baroque and saw many orchestral changes in the opera pit. In Rome, in 1678, a performance of Alessandro Milani's Abele required a string orchestra of six first and six second violins, four violas, a cello, and a bass viol. In 1680, the orchestra had more or less coalesced into a standard Baroque form of violins one and two, violas, cellos, basses, lutes, and harp accord. Minus the lutes, this type of orchestra became the standard across the Italian Baroque. The exclusive use of string orchestra was not prevalent in history. There was always the impetus to add other instruments to the mix, including winds and brass. What held Renaissance ensembles back was the difficulty of tuning these instruments. Instruments were made out of one piece in mean tone temperament and were untunable. It was easy enough to play a solo ensemble with one instrument per part, but the tuning was a major roadblock when multiple instruments of the same kind were involved. Revolutions in woodwind instrument design in the late 17th century in Paris allowed the entrance of these instruments into the string orchestras on a more permanent basis. The almost classical orchestra of the Académie Royale de Musique in 1713 had a wind choir of two each of flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons on top of the string orchestra. The only things that they were missing were horns and timpani. Sometimes recorders were used in these ensembles as part of the wind band, but they were replaced by clarinets as evolution progressed. Let's hear a reproduction of some of Lully's music on modern instruments. The Norwegian Chamber Orchestra performs excerpts from Lully's Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, 
with the standard early Baroque orchestra. Violins in two parts, celli, flutes, oboes, a lute, and a harpsichord. Listen to the equal importance placed on a number of different parts in the texture, a dead giveaway of the music of the Baroque. In the orchestral revolution, the classical orchestra did not appear overnight. It was created in a number of discrete steps from the Baroque orchestra. The biggest driver of the change was the change in taste of music among the aristocracy. The new gallant style, known for its homophonic textures and easily singable melodies, derived from Italian opera, was taking Europe by storm. It was the nucleus by which both the classical orchestra and classical music evolved. The new homophonic texture sounded to death now for the more specialized instruments of the Baroque, like the lute, the recorder, and others. These instruments were good at highlighting the diverse lines of Baroque composition, but were a liability in the more straight streamlined compositions. Their mechanical defects, like tuning issues, dynamic issues, and the like, also saw their decline. The shift to homophonic texture also saw the decline of the basso continuo as a major element in the orchestra. In the Baroque, the basso continuo, made up of the harpsichord, cello, and bass, served as a driving force in the composition, using their moving line as an engine of both harmonic and rhythmic drive. In the new classical style, the bass line plays more of a subsidiary part, providing harmonic support to the melody, taken over by the first violins. The responsibility of chordal support was given to the horns and the oboes, whose more modern construction allowed them to play with more delicacy and flexibility than instruments of the Baroque. This eight-part ensemble, first violins, second violins, violas, celli, basses, oboes one and two, and horns one and two, was a standard in the early classical period. The ensemble was homogeneous, flexible, and melodious and sensitive. It was prepared to capitalize on the sudden dynamic changes that went with the Sturm und Drang artistic movement of the early classical period. The eight-part ensemble was an international standard when Haydn was first employed by the Esterhazys. Let's hear an early symphony by Haydn to see what the eight-part ensemble sounded like. Premiered in 1772, Haydn Symphony No. 45, The Farewell, is written for two oboes, bassoon, doubling the cello part, two horns, first and second violins, viola, and celli. A few things to notice on the example are the chordal role placed by the horns and the oboes. They play long notes against the busy strings. The dominance of the first violins, they have the melodic impetus of the whole excerpt, and the responsiveness of the group to the extremes of dynamics. The ensemble goes from loud to soft dramatically and quickly. Here's a segment of the first movement of Haydn's Symphony No. 45, The Farewell, by Sinfonia Rotterdam.
It was always the variegated opera orchestra that served as an impetus to add instruments to the orchestra. Opera composers of both the Baroque and classical periods used many more instruments than the typical non-operatic orchestras, mainly to generate a massive library of effects. As an example, Gluck's Iphigenia in Tauride, written in 1779 for the Paris Opera, required a piccolo, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, three trombones, timpani, and strings, almost a modern orchestra. Mozart Symphony No. 31, the Paris Symphony, which premiered the year before Gluck's opera, was unusual for its large orchestration, calling for two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets in A, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, timpani, and strings. Nowhere near what Gluck used. It took another 30 years for composers to be able to require that size of an orchestra for a symphony, with the last four works of Beethoven leading the way. Beethoven's last symphony, the ninth, has the largest orchestra of the time, with piccolo, two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets in A, B flat, and C, two bassoons, contrabassoon, four horns in D and B flat and E flat, two trumpets in D and B flat, three trombones, timpani, bass drum, triangle, cymbals, soprano solo, alto solo, tenor solo, baritone or bass solo, SATB choir, and strings. This extreme size of the orchestra was seen as a special occasion orchestra, sometimes with the wind parts doubled and a massive choir. The addition of instruments to the symphonic orchestra really started in the very well-off cities and courts of Europe, where the opera orchestras were the largest. Since the instrumentalists were at court or in the city for the opera orchestra, composers started using them in instrumentation of the symphonic orchestra as well. The city that led the way was Paris, both with the Paris Opera and the Conservatoire, both with large orchestras. The Romantic period, which flourished in Paris, brought a focus on orchestration and what individual instruments and novel pairings could do to create mood in orchestral works. I have a whole video about the history of orchestration if you'd like to check that out. The early 1800s had seen great technological advances in instrument technology, specifically tied to the action of a key or valve, making the woodwinds and the brass much more responsive and able to play in more diverse keys. Composers reveled in the new sounds and textures they could create with the new instruments and started to augment the classical orchestra. One of the leading proponents in the enlarging orchestra was Hector Berlioz. He published the Treatise on Orchestration in 1834, detailing the new techniques possible with the orchestra. It remained the go-to text at instrumentation, with Richard Strauss adding to it in 1905. Many of the colors detailed in the treatise found themselves in Berlioz's work, beginning with the Symphonie Fantastique. Premiered at the Paris Conservatory on December 5, 1830, the work calls for an orchestra of massive size. Two flutes, one doubling piccolo, two oboes, one doubling the English horn, two clarinets, one doubling E-flat clarinet, four bassoons, four horns, two coronets, two trumpets, three trombones, two modern tubas, four timpani played by four players, cymbals, snare drum, bass drum, bells, two harps, and strings. This orchestra uses every modern instrument that could be in an orchestra except for the saxophone and some additional percussion. Let's hear a segment of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. The fifth movement, Dream of a Witch's Sabbath, opens with a tremolo in the upper strings. The strings have been broken down into three violin parts, three second violin parts, and two viola parts. The splitting of strings gives the sound a dense feeling. The strings are also instructed to use their mutes and to play with a pointed bow, giving the tremolos an otherworldly feeling. The timpani are being played simultaneously, creating harmony, not something that the timpani usually does. The oboes, clarinets, and bassoons have a static chord over the 32nd notes in the strings in seven parts, undermining the motion in the strings. The celli and the basses rumble with sextuplets, playing too fast for the ear to hear individual notes, so all we hear is a rumble.
The upper strings are pizzicato, plucking the strings, and then the brass section with added clarinet and bassoons comes in with a descending staccato pattern. The piccolo, flute, and oboe then keen with their rhythm in their upper register designed to be piercing to the ear. This introduction to the fifth movement creates a dramatic and sinister atmosphere while using every section of the orchestra in new and exciting ways. Here's that opening now. Richard Wagner rode the wave of orchestras ever increasing in complexity and size. He started off with the double winds and strings of the classical period in his early works like Die Fien and Das Liebeswebelt. In Lohengrin and Tristan and Isolde, Wagner calls for winds and triples and extensive brass sections. And in the Ring Cycle, he calls for winds in fours, eight horns, four of which are the Wagner tubas, four trumpets, four trombones, and one tuba. This new type of maximal orchestration was seen as the alpha and omega of orchestration by the Weimar School of Wagner and Liszt. To learn more about the Weimar School with Liszt, please see my video series about the composer. This maximal orchestration influenced composers such as Rimsky, Korsakov, Bruckner, Mahler, Strauss, Chanson, and more. A good example of this post-Wagnerian orchestra is the finale of Mahler's monumental Sixth Symphony. This maximal orchestration calls for piccolo, four flutes, four oboes, English horn, E-flat clarinet, three B-flat and A clarinets, bass clarinet, four bassoons, contrabassoon, eight horns, six trumpets, four trombones, tuba, celesta, two harps, six timpani between two players, bass drum, snare drum, cymbals, triangle, cowbells, the famous hammer, tam-tam, the root, untuned bells, glockenspiel, xylophone, and strings. This is one of the largest orchestras used in the symphonic canon today. Let's hear how Mahler uses this orchestra by listening to the opening of the fourth movement.
The modern orchestra is an institution that morphs depending on the forces needed for the program. It can be a hundred players strong for Wagner, Berlioz, Strauss, and Mahler, but it also can be as small as 30 players for Haydn or Mozart. Orchestras nowadays have a core of 30 to 50 players that is augmented depending on the program. The strings, and mostly the first violins, have never been dethroned as the beating heart of the ensemble. Thank you for joining me in this video about the evolution of the orchestra. Like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more. What do you want to learn about next? Leave me a comment down below. You can also support the making of these videos on Patreon. These videos take over 20 hours of research to complete, so Patreon is a great way to show your support. The bibliography for this video can be found on my website, dominicroyam.com. Interested in seeing my process? I document it on my social media, so follow me for more updates. My handles are listed below. Thanks again, and see you in my next video.